are found in the Pacific Northwest Council. You can find them online, but you have to realize that that's the Pacific Coast, California and, and Washington and Oregon uh, and, and not here. Although we may have some of the same species. So uh, that's a, a, a tough thing to, to think about. So, uh, all right, we're okay to go to the PowerPoint. Thank you, Luke. <laughs> okay, uh, and you'll notice that on that first page, I actually did this 10 years ago. So uh, some of those older books were still in use. So again, what is a key? It's a tool to identify an organism. There are sets of choices to follow and usually two, and that means two cuts or two choices, dichotomous is the word. You always have to start at number one. In a flow chart, you always start at the top. You read the choices and you pick the phrase or choice that best describes the characteristics of your unknown organism. You then follow what it says to do, such as uh, go to four or dot, 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 plane four. And if it does say that, you skip choices two and three. You go right to four. Uh, you don't read even, you don't even look at two and three. And then you read the two choices at four and see what they are. You pick the one that fits your organism and it will again tell you where to go. Um, okay, we are now going to look at the unknown organism that goes with the brown spore page that uh, you printed out. So the next, okay, so if you've got a flow chart in front of you for brown spored mushrooms. This is how it's going to work. I've shown you a picture. I've given you some descriptions on the side of that uh, picture. If you can read them, okay. And so you're going to start at the top of the brown sport page. And in this case, your choices are shown by arrows. So the first choice would be on those two arrows, it says stalks lateral or stalks central. And you have to make a choice by looking at that picture. I'm not going to tell you. Uh, and now this is the deal. I want you to follow either the picture or the description on the side and come down to a name or names, which would be the, the genus or genera of these particular unknowns. And when you are done, you can just write in the chat, I'm done. So I'm assuming when we get five people that say they're done, all right, I will explain, I will give the name. I don't want anybody to uh, unmute or call anything out. I want you to practice. Uh, and then we'll go through how we got it, all right. Um, and unfortunately, those of you that don't have the page, <laughs> are just going to, um, you know, uh, lose out a little bit. Everybody, okay, good. <laughs> I've got three duns, wonderful. <laughs> and I hope you. it's not just because you know the mushroom. All right, yay, I see six duns. And someone maybe with a question, that's okay too. 
All right, so uh, I'm just going to wait another 30 seconds to see if we have any more duns. There are, there were over 20 people signed on here, but um, I'm not going to wait for 10 duns because maybe some of you don't even have the, the page in front of you. It looks like there are um, maybe a question, Dorothy, from somebody. Is that all right for people to ask questions? Uh, sure, I can. She can unmute uh, when we go through it or whatever you think. Yeah, use your judgment. Okay, if you think it's relevant, go ahead and jump in there. Well, I can't tell if, um, you know, what the, what the stipes are exactly, if they are erect or if they're curved. I, I didn't catch that. From the picture, they're sort of, the stipes are sort of bent. Were they straight or were they? Oh, uh, no, these are just very fragile, skinny, hollow stems that just got bent. Okay. And someone is stuck on lateral or central. Uh, if you know football, a lateral pass means a pass to the side and central, if its stem is attached centrally to the cap of the mushroom. Lateral would mean that it was be attached to the very side of it. Uh, certain polypores or shelf fungi have, have lateral stalks and even some gill fungi like um, uh, some of the pleurotus types have lateral stalks. I hope that answers your question, Kathleen. Okay, I've got a lot of duns there, so I think, uh, oh, TY is thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so this definitely, you see this stipe coming right into the center of the cap underneath here. So that's a central attachment. You're given the information that it has rusty brown spores. So under stalk central on your key, you have two arrows. In this case, they're really not side by side because that's the problem with doing a flow chart uh, on a single page. But you can follow the spores rust brown instead of the spores ochre clay brown or brown. And then you have two more choices, caps, um, less than three centimeters or caps greater than C centimeters. And you're given that information in the picture, less than three centimeters. So now it says they're conical or convex with a slender stalk. So, you know, your image may be of a bully with a big fat stalk. These are slender and they also happen to be kind of hollow. Uh, and if you look at the young one right here, you can actually uh, see that this is rather bell-shaped or convex. Uh, and and you, the last clue is they're in grass. So that is the arrow on the right. And it says they're fruiting in moss, wood, or, oh, sorry about that, caps. I quickly made the wrong cho choice. Um, that's because my greater than or less than I messed up. So uh, it's less than, and these have a convex cap and you go down and we don't see any rings on the side of the stem. Oh, I, and I'm reading poorly because I'm not seeing, I was right the first time, less than three centimeters, brooding on ground or in grass is the other choice. The choice you want to take is on 
the left, and then the, the stalks uh, look like they're curving, but really they're, they're erect when this thing is um, mature and not old uh, and plopped on a cardboard to take a photograph. So your two choices were conocybe and bulbiteus. Uh, and these are uh, bulbiteus uh, titubans. The old name was bulbiteus vitilinus. Um, conocybe basically have real conical, the common ones are the dunce caps with very uh, cone-shaped caps, uh, whereas this one is definitely more convex. So I hope everybody <laughs> didn't follow my silliness and um, you got down to uh, conocybe or bulbidius. So yes, Bianca. <laughs> um, and these are two bulbidius, yes, there's Actually, this is a young one, and these are older, and uh, the, the cap sometimes is hygrophonous. These are all the same species found in the grass, uh, like the dunce caps. Okay, so that's basically a flow chart. Um, you could use this, but it, again, it's like the one in, um, the uh, Baron book. The next style. Oh, someone says there are two ways to get to Balbidius. That is. Uh, correct. But there may be um, some other different species, but this particular one with the rusty brown spores. Um, leads you on that left hand of that flow chart. Okay, uh, the next style of key, all right, you're going to use uh, the page that looks like this and it says, uh, on the right side, Graham Mushrooms of the Great Lakes region. I use this book quite a lot. Uh, it's basically all keys. There are a couple of line drawings in the back, no color pictures whatsoever, but it was a great book in the 1970s when I joined the club. Um, and now we see a Lactarius uh, in this style of a dichotomous key, again, the choices are in usually in pairs, sometimes more than two. Uh, they may be three as a choice. And you always start at number one. This one has one and one prime. Sometimes you'll see one A and one B, and sometimes you'll see just one one. But again, always start at the beginning. And um, we can scroll down with the, the chat. Uh, and so go ahead and try this. The info is on the side or in the picture. Although, you know, we may disagree at the end, <laughs> but that's okay. I'll give you a few minutes to work through. And again, when you're finished, yep, I got somebody done. <laughs> it 
Virginia is very used to using keys, I believe, with slime molds. <laughs> Make sure you look to see if there are three choices instead of just two. Good, three duns. When you get into several steps, I find it's useful to jot down the numbers. And that way, if you get lost, you can always go back. So I usually just keep a little running. Yes. Good idea. Thanks, Liz. That's eight duns, nine. That's good. <laughs> Excellent. So, and there's more. I hope, um, yeah, th th this is the, one of the easiest style keys. And I hope everyone came down to, I mean, you may disagree with me, but I think this is uh, Lactarius Chrysoreus. Any, everybody get that? I hope. <laughs> Um, and so um, the, the second choice at the beginning, milk at first white, changing to color, takes you all the way to 23. So you don't even look at everything uh, good. Yes, <laughs> I've got some good answers there. So you go to 23 and there happens to be three 23s. So um, becoming yellow takes you to 26. Um, it doesn't seem to be, it says uh, smooth margin, not hairy. Or, so uh, it takes you to 27. And uh, it says it's zone eight. Now you may not agree with me, but um, sometimes it can appear more or less zone eight, but um, especially toward the margin. And then you go to 28, there are three choices. And since the milk is bitter, uh, being a lactarius, these are the milk mushrooms, uh, the word acrid means bitter. So, all right. So it comes down to a name, um, Chrysoreus. So great. And I hope, uh, Everybody got that right or close to it. And if, if you want me to go through it again on the page. So ready for the next one then? I have to say, Dorothy, what you did, you did your observations first and then you, you filled it in. That's a really useful technique to look at. Is it zone eight? Okay, it's a milk mushroom. Does the milk change colors? It saves you a lot of time if you just get your observations done and then you try to look at the key. Oh, it's yes. Kind of trying yeah. to do step by step. And, you know, Ray Fado and uh, Rod Tullis, they created their own little um, information page on every mushroom they collected. And they did, they filled out all the characteristics, odor, um, you know, shape of the stem or stipe, uh, uh, viscid or sticky or not, e everything about it and size, color, anything they could was on this little info page. Um, Ray got his down to the size of a, you know, a three by five card almost. Uh, but that's what you need to do. Just observe as much as you can. Gill attachment, um, you know, stem hollow, bruising, all that stuff needs to be looked at before you even want to go to a key. And the other thing is the spore print too. 
Uh, and we're going to find in the, my last type of key that it's going to be based on microscopic characters. Um, you'll be able to at least understand how to use the key. It's called a multi-access key, but some of you I'm sure don't have microscopes, but nevertheless, uh, you know, um, that's the, the thing to do. So, um, all right, the next page then. So this is Lactarius chrysoreus. Uh, this one is, is, is tricky and, you know, I don't know if you can, no, nope, I gotta hold it in front of the camera. I don't know if you can see, I'm holding up one of these um, bracket fungi. Um, let me see, back up a little bit. So there's an undersurface where you see this edge uh, and there's the cap. And also in the picture. So if we go back now to the uh, PowerPoint and this page, uh, could, I think comes from, maybe not, Overholtz or low, and, you know, everything a long time ago, a lot of bracket fungi were just polyporous. Uh, and so it, even in the bis, first Bisset book on Boletes, you had a beginning key to thus the major groups you know, could be based on, on stem structure. And then it took you, when you did that key, you had to go to a different key. So there are some that do that. Uh, the, the lichen book I have is like that. So in this particular one, um, you're actually starting, you figured out that this is a historically a polyporous. <laughs> and um, so you're looking at that page, key to the species. So you're looking at one and then it, you have to read those two choices at one and then go to the right um, section. Okay, so give this a try. Trying to follow sections and subsections. and the information is on the side, plus what I showed you. <laughs> this might take a little longer, but um, when you're finished, you can say done, please. It's also helpful if you know your trees. I'm getting some duns.
Okay, I'm getting Duns in. Um, and again, uh, with, with polypores, um, if it has some kind of a stem, that's called stipitate. <laughs> and when you slice through top to bottom in, in any mushroom, uh, what's under the cap before the pores or gills is called the context. So as a beginner, you might not know that. So I think I'm getting some, some duns. So um, we'll go through how you landed on this. Um, of course, the name has changed and that's what happens when you have old keys. I still use this old polypore key uh, by Overholtz. Um, and because it's not based on, on macroscopic um, characteristics. So I use it, I, come, can, I can come down to an old name and then I look up the new name because I also have Gilbertson and Rivarden, or you can look up the new name on Index Fungorum, um, which is online um, from, from the old name from, uh, so, but anyway, um, this uh, stem is said to be substipitate and, and that in the very first uh, choice on the page takes you to section one. In section one, the context is white. So you take that to subsection one and um, the first choice at three was stem not black at base. So you're going to uh, four and the stem um, unbranched going to five, the stem is lateral, um, which takes you to 13 under Roman numeral one and then 13 or it's actually under Roman numeral two, uh, at 13, um, the fruiting body size-wise, uh, you, you know, you can tell by the trunk on the tree that it's, it's larger than one centimeter, takes you to 14, I'm sorry, um, much larger, takes you to 15, can't even read. <laughs> um, and the margin of the pileus is thick. That's what I was doing when I was holding up that margin on the underside. Um, and so it comes down to, and on birch trees, this happens to be a birch tree. If you can see in the picture of uh, birches and cherries are the only, uh, common native trees here in New Jersey with horizontal lenticels on uh, a young trunk or the branches. Uh, these lines here on the side of the picture are, are lenticels uh, and they allow air in to the bark uh, and, and they're always horizontal. So this happens to be a birch tree and this is the birch polypore and the old name was Polyporus betulinus. It then became known as Piptoporus uh, betulina, and now it's known, uh, or betulinus, now it's known as Fomatopsis betulina. So uh, several name changes. So I hope you were able to follow that, but just be aware that some keys start out and may take you to sections. Hope. Okay, so I've got some, I hope everyone was pretty good. This is one that, you know, we've seen in a lot of taxonomy sessions. So um, I hope you knew the name of it anyway, <laughs> common name, birch polypore. 
Um, all right, so here we are to uh, the Mycenae key, and this is what we call the indent key. Some people get confused at this because the choices are not necessarily near each other, but um, each time, um, you, you, matter of fact, one, the first number one may be on one page and the second number one may be on the very next page with a whole lot of stuff uh, in between. So um, once you pick your choice, you go directly below to the next indent, all right? So in, on this page of the Mycena key, and this is a translation from Pomelo's uh, French key by Clark Rogerson, uh, who used to speak to our, uh, the New Jersey club quite often. And every time he came, he brought a handout, um, which was the French, the English translation from the French of Pomelo's book. And uh, this one he gave us in, in 1983. He was the um, crypto, um, crypto, but um, he was at the New York Botanic Garden and the cryptogamic uh, botanist there. Um, so he did fungi and, and other things with uh, kind of hidden uh, reproductive structures. So uh, your, again, your information is on the uh, right-hand side. Cespitose means clustered. Campanulate means bell-shaped, all right? And the latex or juice. Uh, and viscid sticky. So go ahead with that. This should, you should finish fast. We've got a few duns, waiting for some more. Okay, um, on this page, you see the number ones are actually separated by some twos up at the top, uh, but there's no colored latex or juice. So you're taking that um, second number one choice on the page. And then you look at three, it says stipe, viscid or glutinous. If you look, you want to see the other choice and it's down halfway on the page. Stipe dry, okay. Or somewhat viscid when humid. So 
it, this is something that you might have to look um, at both of these. But if you pick the first number three, you go right down below to the first four and read that, then the second four, and you follow it. As, you're, as you move, you're indenting each time. And that's a clue to help you find uh, where, where you're going or where that other choice is located. And it just so happens that, I mean, if I had given more information, you can even find this species in the, in the second choice, number three. But um, it's right up there in the top at, at the first choice, number seven. Um, so this is Mycena liana. And uh, a lot of you have some beautiful pictures of, of this clustered mushroom always growing on wood. So how did everybody do? Were there any questions, any trouble? Okay, everybody's good. <laughs> or I see a couple of goods. <laughs> you can unmute if you want to, if you have a question. Ruthie, sometimes I found this actually with Igor and I took it home and did microscopy on it because I really wasn't sure. I always find these things in clusters, but this one day it wasn't in a cluster. It was just a single one, one part of the log and on a whole different section of the log, there was one. I'd never seen that with the liana, but it certainly checked out every other box for it. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I had Maricel double check it too, but that's what we agreed on, so. I'd never seen that happen. Right, usually in a cluster. Maybe it just didn't have a lot of nutrition. <laughs> Maybe it was an old log. <laughs> Used up its uh, nutrient source. Ah, see, someone was saying this one is hard. This was very difficult. Um, can I assume that all these keys are interchangeable? Oh, I'm not sure what you mean by that question, uh, Jim. Can you explain on by unmuting? Okay. Uh, yeah, what, what I meant by that is we get to the result following different uh, paths. But all the keys are leading you down a certain path, but in a different way. Right, they're leading you to, if the key includes the, the unknown that you have, you know, you're gonna come to its name possibly. Uh, but then, um, you know, with a key like this, or let's say the Graham book, you get a name, then you have to, go find out about that, you know, do a Google search and find the descriptions that uh, and information um, further, does it, does the characteristic of, of this species really fit your unknown? Um, it, okay. These are just different styles of keys. Uh, in, in each case there, um, you know, I'm showing you something that would fit a, a picture, a photo, and descriptions that work with the key. I, I'm not sure I answered your question. Okay. If I still understand well, it. <laughs> but, but let, let me let me put it this way: Could the key that we just used for Mycena in the northeast be done so that it has this? It has a diagram similar to the brown sport that we started with. A flow chart? Oh, yeah, yes. A flow chart, yeah. Yes, yeah. It could be transferred to a flow chart, could also be transferred to the typical dichotomous key, but it's what the scientist that was doing it felt comfortable with, with the kind of key that he knew. I mean, uh, again, I showed you two lichen books 
uh, that like this indent style of key. Uh, but right. the Brodo book, which is nine pounds, uh, a really big fat book, has wonderful keys, but they're dichotomous style. All right. So, you know, you don't have to have a style like this indent if you don't want to. But yes, that now I see your point. Um, you, you, the the author of the key can certainly choose uh, a different style, so they can be interchangeable that way. Okay, thanks. That's what I was getting at. Yep. Okay. Yeah, some people find this indent key difficult, but you know I'm used to it, so I I know how to use it. <laughs> and again. Uh, I think the, the Mycena key of Clark Rogerson, this is just the first page. Uh, it actually is like three or four pages when he handed it out in January 1983 to the club. So now we come to a last style. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, can I ask a question? I'm sorry, I just got here. I, I fell asleep and I woke up a little while ago. Um, and I just noticed that, that I was supposed to print the keys up, but I looked at them quickly be, before I, I signed on. But I'm wondering here, doesn't Mycena Leanna, doesn't it, um, doesn't it have like orange liquid that gets on your fingers when you pick it? I um, thought that it did. You know, not, not like hematopus. Yeah. It's glutinous. It has orange gluteny stuff that gets on your fingers, but it's not, it's not the latex. Yeah, it's not the latex. Oh, okay. I see. There's a distinction there. All right. Thanks. Okay. So our next key, all right, is called a multi-access key. And um, if any of you are familiar with wildflowers, uh, there's a, a book by Newcomb uh, that uses this style. You basically fit some simple characteristics um, into a code. You put it into a code. Uh, and um, Ray Fado's uh, Rusala key, uh, Fado Kibi key, uh, does this. And this page I'm showing you is a provisional key done a long time ago when Roger Phillips was visiting. Uh, and it again, it's based on microscopic characteristics. And so I've given you those descriptions on the side. I've shown you a photograph of um, the species. And um, so on each step, you pick a letter uh, from the different columns or rows across. Uh, I'll start you on the first one. It says that when you look at the spores of this inosopy, uh, they're going to be smooth. A lot of inosopies have very knobby, bumpy spores, but under the microscope, it's going to be smooth. So you would say that the beginning of your code is the capital letter A. Then go to the next row and you read those and so on down the page until you come up with a code. And if you have a pencil, you know, write your code uh, on, the, on the side of the page as you're looking at the descriptive um, items, characteristics on the side. If you have any questions on vocabulary, uh, you know, unmute and, and ask. Oh, I'm already getting a couple of duns. <laughs> There's another one.
Okay, that's that's cool. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Fantastic. So if you looked at the descriptions um, and you, you did have a microscope and you could figure all this out, uh, your code would be these letters. A, D, F, I, K. And that would lead you to um, probably a dichotomous key. In Ray Fado's Bruce of the Key, this is how it works. Uh, and those particular, that particular code actually has nine species, including Inosope fastigiata in those days. Um, it's straw colored. Uh, the cap actually, as it matures, kind of uh, splits along uh, radii lines, uh, radius lines. And it is now known as um, Inosabe rimosa, R-I-M-O-S-A, or commonly called the torn fiber cap. Uh, all Inosabes are toxic too. So, you know, be cautious when, um, don't, don't eat them. <laughs> um, so yes, this is an easy style key uh, to figure out uh, and, uh, Trouble is with Ray Fado's Bruce of the Key, um, you know, what, what characteristics are really important and how does the weather, uh, whether something is wet, affects some of the characteristics. One of them with Rusula is how much the cap peels. Uh, another one is actually the color of the spore deposit. Well, Ray, when he made the key, he would actually get the spore deposit on a piece of, of uh, a glass slide and scrape it together with a razor blade. So it would appear darker than if you're looking at a spore deposit on a piece of paper, um, on white paper. So, you know, it, it's tricky and sometimes you could come down to a wrong choice uh, and, and you, you just have to uh, go back to the beginning and read some descriptions. So how did everybody do on that one? Uh, as long as you got it to the correct code. And then you would look at a dichotomous key with, with only nine species, including uh, the one that's pictured, uh, Inosope rimosa. So, um, on the next slide, and I haven't, uh, we all know mushroomexpert.com has wonderful keys uh, in a very simple dichotomous pattern, very easy to, to use. Um, and uh, I'm not sure about the one from Denmark. I haven't checked that at all in the last few years or michaelweb.com. Um, again, there is the Pacific Northwest Key Council, but that's uh, the West Coast. Um, and if you're not familiar with um, Gary Amberger's uh, from Messiah College, if you're interested in, in fungi on wood, doesn't necessarily have keys, but um, he's got great examples of, of fungi that you can find on wood. And, um, and I'm sure a lot of you have other keys that you use that you like. Uh, I do like field guides that include keys, uh, not just pictures. So one of the first books that I ever used in 1972 was Orson Miller's um, book, which had keys to each of the a genera of the ones included in the book. So, you know, lots of times I went wrong, but the mushroom I was looking at wasn't in his book. So, okay, I, we can switch to um, the gallery view. And 
if, if anybody has any questions, we're gonna be able to leave early, but I, I hope this helped you a little bit if you're a beginner on, on kind of understanding how different keys work. Any, any questions at all? You know, please unmute yourself. And um, were you successful for the most part, <laughs> I hope? <laughs> that was really great, Dorothy, to go through all the keys like that because uh, sometimes it, it's good to get experience like that because if you, if you try to do a key and you haven't done it before, there's a lot of little tricks that you showed us. So I, that was very good, I think. Writing the steps down as you go is also really useful. And then if you go wrong, you can always go back and go, okay, I was unsure about that. Let me try it from a different perspective. Uh -huh. And as a beginner, I mean, you, you struggle with keys. Um, I did, matter of fact, I still was doing it, <laughs> trying to, to, to read the flow chart. Um, you know, if you jump too fast, that's what happens. <laughs> But um... yeah, Dorothy, it was it was very helpful. I just get stuck on um, the definitions of the certain things, yeah. you know, that the sort of the technical terms, and that's where I got stuck. Is that one? I forget what it was. I had no idea. I was totally lost on that really hard one. <laughs> I was completely lost. Well, well you can yeah. just look them up on Google. I just, I I also there were words I didn't know, and I looked them up on my phone. And I was doing that. Yes, I was doing that, but it was just, I was under that time pressure too of everybody saying, done, done, done. Um, <laughs> and I was, you know, sort of like a Jeopardy moment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but thank you. See, I appreciate it. I grew up before cell phones. Uh, I'm a paper person. So I love my field guides. And if you get a good field guide, they should have a, a you know, vocabulary in the back. Um, and so make a printout copy that you can kind of carry with you of your terms. Um, so that, that might help. Carry it with you in your mushroom basket. <laughs> okay, that, that, that's an excellent idea, thank you. And, uh, and there are some field guides that have beautiful um, picture descriptions not even words of some of the vocabulary. And that might be, um, you know, more agreeable to you. Uh, for instance, if a, uh, they use a word describing another word that you don't know either. <laughs> so a, a picture sometimes, um, you know, it is very good instead. Yeah, I, I, I find um, the pictures are very helpful. That's, that's why I thought the your discussion was very interesting and helpful as well, because I've only found um, my being able to identify through pictures only and not by key, because I have no idea what any of those words mean. Uh, but, you know, I'm learning. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Sometimes if someone, if, if you get the right answer by someone gives it to you, or you can get it by looking at the pictures to practice, Go backwards through the key and see how you got there when you have the right answer. And that helps you, to, I think, to learn how to use the keys. Mm -hmm. Getting so, uh, dictionary to I'm sure Luke is going to have um, to tell us what's coming up as well. Yes. So thank you very much, Dorothy. A round of applause for you. I know you can't hear it because we're all muted, but everyone's clapping. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much for doing that for us. Um, I did record this, so it will go on to the, uh, the you know, the in JMA YouTube, where I've been putting all the taxonomy Tuesdays, so we can go back and review. Um, or if you didn't catch all of it, it will be there. Um, upcoming events this Friday, which is the 16th at 7 p.m. Roy Holling will be doing a presentation on Australian boletes. So Roy Holling is a, uh, a boletologist and a local mycologist. He's from, he lives in New York um, and is well known 
and the local clubs, but he's been traveling to Australia, like I think on a regular, on every year, he said for the past like 20 years, catalog, cataloging the beliefs of Australia. So he's doing a, uh, a really cool talk this Friday on that. So I'm looking forward to seeing some photographs from the other side of the world. And then of course, next Tuesday, we're back to our regular taxonomy Tuesday schedule. And uh, we uh, are finding mushrooms out there. So we'll be able to show them off next Tuesday, all right? Hey, Lucas, um, we're going to let us tape that because I have a conflict that night. Yes. He has permission to record it. So there will be a recording of that one. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. I have um, one announcement. I hope I can make it. <laughs> um, if you're interested in lichens and you're in northern New Jersey, I'm going to be doing a program at Sherman Hoffman's um, Wildlife Sanctuary of New Jersey Audubon this Sunday, April 18th at two o'clock. Uh, it's going to be all outdoors, um, um, talk and a walk. Um, there'll be handouts. Uh, again, you have to wear a mask, but um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about lichens, which are in the fungi kingdom, um, they're fascinating organisms. They have a lot of cultural uses by humans and animals and um, so if you go to New Jersey Audubon's website, uh, njaudubon.org, uh, and hit the calendar, uh, and then scroll down to April 18th, uh, you can register for the class. Uh, if you are a New Jersey Audubon member, it's only $10. Uh, if you're a non-member, it'll be $15 but I hope some of you can, can join me and you'll work through some uh, lichen keys <laughs> uh, to the common lichens in New Jersey. You do have to register before the five o'clock on April 17th if you're interested. And New Jer uh, Sherman Hoffman Sanctuary is in Bernardsville, New Jersey. So, Thank you for letting me put that plug in. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Dorothy. All right. Uh, anything else before we sign off for the night? All right. Well, thank you all very much for attending. Again, thank you, Dorothy. And um, I hope everyone can put this to good use. And I will see everyone later this week or next Tuesday. All right? Yep. <laughs> all right. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, thank you.